Okay, but let's go to today's program and let's move to our first speaker. Uh, uh, our first speaker is going to be Colleen Scott. Uh, if we can have Colleen slides, please, Denise. Actually, Colleen is going to go ahead and host her own. There she goes. Oh, okay, great. Okay, so C Colleen is a is a member of the of the of the CCHF Center and uh, has been a really driving. Uh, applications of CH functionalization towards material science. And so we're very much looking forward to a talk entitled CH functionalization, a viable route to organic materials. Okay, all yours, Colleen. Uh, thanks, thanks you. Um, I just wanna thank um, the CCHF Center um, for giving me this opportunity to give this talk and present my work. Um, I thank everybody for showing up um, wherever you are around the world. And um, I hope to um, tell you a little bit about what we're doing in my group. So my group um, focuses on organic polymeric materials. We do, do some thermoplastic and conducting plastic. And we also do some small molecule um, sensors for chemical and biological sensors. So in the thermoplastic arena, we do some work on um, some sustainable chemistry, trying to use bio-based materials to make high performance um, compounds through different functional groups like the ester and amide bonds or ether bonds. In our small molecule um, chemical and biological sensor, we've been developing these rhodamine-based fluorophores for, um, for, for imaging and sensing. And so I'll talk a little bit today about um, two of these um, chromophores that we have down at the bottom that we have been able to synthesize and how CH activation chemistry helped us in this area. We also do work on conducting plastics, um, looking at compounds like silos to incorporate them into polymers for um, field effect transistors and and other organic devices. And we also do some work on DPP. I'll talk a little bit about the silo, but not the DPP um, particular today. And we have this other really cool chemistry going on on these um, polyaniline-like um, uh, polymers that, um, that have some nice, interesting um, magnetic properties as well as um, conductive properties and some and stability. But today I'll talk more about how the, the CH, um, CH functionalization has helped our chemistry um, move forward. So like most of you know why we want to do CH activation. So traditional functional group interconversions require multiple steps and, um, and, and sometimes harsh reaction conditions, as well as if you even doing it on cross coupling reactions, it require you to have a, a halogenated um, um, aerial compound, and you have to pre-functionalize the material with either the boron, the tin, or different organometallic reagent to do the cross-coupling reaction to get to your product. Whereas for CH activation, if we can do that in one step, then we should be able to accomplish that same goal, um, and it should be more feasible. But of course, there's a reason why these cross-coupling reactions um, don't go away. Because the advantage that I'm, I'm, I'm highlighting, circling here, is that these reactions are, are typically robust. But they do have their disadvantages, which is the toxic waste products that are produced. Of course, the multiple reaction step that I pointed out is, and, most, and the stoichiometric amount of these toxic waste that we, we create, are, and also the reagent. Now for the direct A relation, RCH activation reaction, if we're focusing on mostly sp2 hybridized chemistry, then the, adv the advantages here is that you reduce the number of steps and eliminate these toxic reagents. One of the disadvantages over is that the CH bond, as we know, is thermodynamically unfavorable. So we have to have some um, ways to, to activate them to react. And so, this is even much more highlighted for materials because if, when you're talking about materials, you're, you're thinking about cheap starting um, 
the, the feedstock. So you, you have to be able to do it this cheaply. And you also want some sustainability in it. So you want to have your, your, your material be prepared to, um, to be atom economical. And of course, with CH activation becoming more robust, it's been um, helpful to, to look at it from this way. So any reaction that we want to do on materials need to be robust. And, um, and of course, toxic waste um, is not our friend as well. So, um, so it really highlights for materials why we want to incorporate CH activation. The drawback here is, of course, the multiple stage bonds. So selectivity is an issue. Is an issue, and um, and the reaction is typically substrate dependent, as well as the reaction condition can change um, depending on different different reasons that I, I don't get into right now. So. Um, I just want to, uh, with that introduction, to just um, bring you to what I want to show you how we have been using CH activation in three of um, some of our work here. So I talk about give you three stories, three brief stories, um, some previous work that we've done to look at silo con um, silo containing polymers, and um, some recent work that we just published. Um, to, to look at emissive dyes and how we have, this, have a new design approach to these dyes. And some very, very new work um, that we're, we're doing now to look at um, post-functionalization of commodity products. Why do we want to do the post-functionalization of commodity product? It has been one of our grand challenges in the center for the material um, materials group. And so um, I'll tell you a little bit more when I get to those slides. So the first one we want to talk about are these silo polymers. So as you guys know about um, conducting polymers, that um, polymers were not normally known to be conductive until uh, back in the 70s when it was shown that you can dope these things and you can move them from insulator into the semiconductive area or even depend on the, dope, the amount of doping, you can get them close into the close to metals. And so, um, in 2000, Heger, McDermott, and Shirakawa won the Nobel Prize for the development of conducting polymers. So uh, why we wanted to have conducting polymers, so the, 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 the applications can be very broad, but it's mostly um, aimed towards organic devices. For example, you can make these flexible organic circuits. If you have flexible circuits, you can make flexible devices. And um, they can be used for sensors as well as for your solar panel. So the idea here is that if you can have polymer materials, you can pretty much roll these materials and process them. And, and they're typically much cheaper to do that. So um, to do that, though, using um, for, our, for conjugated polymers, you typically use cr traditional cross-coupling reactions. And so it becomes a problem when you start wanting to make electron poor materials. For example, acceptor building blocks, some of which I'm showing on the bottom um, right corner, um, are typically unstable to the, re the reaction conditions like strong nucleophiles or reducing agents. and um, they're not that easy to access. So trying to get the boring or the tin reagents um, can, can also be difficult. And so that's gonna limit your scope of what reactions you can do. And of course, we've talked about the multiple synthetic steps before. However, should we be able to, to access these materials, they can be very impactful because these materials are in great demand for photovoltaic and transistor applications. So when we got into this um, chemistry, um, we were interested in using silos because they were shown to be good electron deficient material and have potential applications um, in um, field effect transistors and, um, and other things. Um, there are other, other reasons we wanted to explore silos. One of is which we can tune the band gap easily by the groups that we put on the two and the five positions. And, um, and 
they have also been shown, shown to give very good stable transistors when, when put in air. So we decided to look into um, silo as a building block for polymers. So um, we did a lot of work before we got here. So um, about 2013, Ozawa um, published a paper um, that showed that you can use CH activation chemistry to make very high molecular weight polymers, which you cannot access through the traditional cross coupling reaction like Suzuki and Stilly. And so that had, um, got a lot of people interested, including myself when I was in introduced to this chemistry. And so we decided to try using CH activation for some of our silo chemistry. So we've been able to make the silo, I put the reference here on top of how we, we do that. And the idea here is if I, we can do a direct stage activation on the, on the thiophene, uh, on the silo with any of these electron deficient molecule I'm showing down here, the DPP and the DFBT, then that could help us access some of these electron deficient material quickly. So I'm one of those people who like to jump in the middle of the ocean and then decide if I can swim. <laughs> and so uh, we jumped right into it. So we had this precursor, this silo precursor, the tetrafluorobenzene in hand from some other work we were doing. And so we decided to try um, two different conditions to do this chemistry. So our expected product is over here on the right. So obviously we're making a CH bond between the tetrafluorobenzene and the thiophene on the DPP. And so my student came and was like, oh, we have polymers, nice and blue and everything. So I said, run the UV. When we look at the UV, I was thinking something doesn't look right here. So we were expecting, like I said, this polymer with this electron deficient tetrafluorobenzene. So I'm expecting a blue shift in the, um, sorry, a red shift in the um, UV spectra compared to this blue peak here which has just benzene, not no tetrafluoro group on there. Instead, we get this red, this red um, band here, which is blue shifted. And so um, the P1 is over here on this red, that's that blue um, absorption, um, the, blue, the blue spectra, the blue curve. And so that's what we, um, we had as a, a, a ballpoint. But when we looked at the UV, we realized that it was blue shift. So upon further analysis through NMR, we realized that what happened was we did get polymerization, but we also got desilation. And the desilation allowed for the blue shift. And so uh, we spent a lot of time do, um, do screening a lot of reaction conditions to prevent this desilation, but we were not able to do that. And so we decided, well, since we can't do the, have the CH bond on the portion, the moiety that has the, the silo on it, what, what if we brominate it and do a CH reaction on the other part? And so when we did that, we got no ring open. So we got polymers, there was no ring opening. And so we, we went ahead and um, looked at the series of benzothiodiazole, the difluoro group, um, with, with um, changing the, the hetero atom from silica, selenium, nitrogen, oxygen, and so forth. We also compared um, some of set, um, the dicyanodibenzothiodiazole at benzothiodiazole to, as a comparison. So we made a series of polymers. The R group we had was the um, ethyl hexyl. And um, while we didn't get very great molecular weight in this, I. I really think it's because of the R group that we chose. Um, we need a much bigger um, bulkier group for, for the, the solubility um, to increase in the solvent so we can get higher polymerization. But we did get some polymer that we were able to map on UV. So I'm just going to quickly point this out. So um, as you can see, the polymer 5, the, di the di um, cyano compound, um, it gave the, the, the lowest band gap, optical band gap, I should say. And um, the selenium and the sulfur was next in line, the um, oxygen and the nitrogen, not so much. So if you look at the molecular weight, we didn't have good molecular weight for the, the, di, the, the dicyano compound, 
but we had good molecular, decent molecular weight for P1 and um, not so good for P2, but we still tried to make some um, films from these. So um, we collaborated with Christine and um, measured the, the whole mobility of these compounds. And we saw that the, the compound with the sulfur, the one that we had the best, better molecular weight, so we got better films, we had whole mobility in the, or, in the region of 10 to the minus two. Um, this, is, this is really good because this is um, some of the state of the art for, um, for silo compounds, not necessarily the one that we were, we were making. We're a little disappointed in the selenium um, whole mobility. We're expecting it to be a little bit better, but I think we just didn't have high enough molecular weight to get good film. So, that's something we can look into later on. So to conclude here, how um, direct aeration helped us to make these polymers. Um, as I mentioned that the whole mobilities um, we recorded was in the order of 10 to the minus two centimeter square per volt second. And um, which is at least two orders of magnitude better than was previously reported for this dithyenyl silo. So this is the state of the art. So um, we are, we are right there with the dithyenyl silo. And we are much better than previous dithyenyl silo. So uh, we were pretty excited about this. So that just concludes one of the polymers that we did for with CH activation. I wanna jump into the small molecules, how we are using this to make small molecules. Um, molecules um, dyes. So um, the significance of this work is in the bioimaging area. So we need to study cellular biology. So we need to be able to see the cells. And we need a lot of different colors. So we need to have a variety of probes. In addition, these probes can also be used to treat cancer by the, pho um, the photodynamic therapy approach. Um, as they act as photosensitizer. And um, we want to make sure the wavelengths are deep, are long enough so we can get deep penetration and less cellular damage. So the longer the absorption emission wavelength, the deeper they can penetrate into the cell and the less cell damage you get. In addition, if you're in this near IR1, near IR2 region, which is the near IR1 is about 650 to about 900. Near IR2 is above 900, below 14 um, nanometers. Um, then you can get very good resolution in the cell because you don't get autofluorescence from the cell. And so, like I said, the wavelength range that we're aiming for is between 650 to 1400 nanometers. Those are the, the that's what we need to where we need to be. So um, there are many dyes that have been um, produced that can get us close to those areas. Most of these dyes are the common um, chromophores that you will see in the literature. These cyanine, squarene, bodipi dyes, also um, parole containing um, scaffolds. And these dyes can get you absorption emission in the near IR1 in, in most of the cases. So the approach um, for xanthine-based dyes, which is what we're interested in, so these um, rhodamine and fluorescein dyes, it was shown that if you change the substituent in the xanthine core from oxygen to silicon, you can redshift the, um, the absorption and, and emission wavelength to about 90 nanometers. And if you add phosphorus, you can further shift these. So people have incorporated in a variety of different combinations, even including this carbon here, you can change that for different atom to, to get different dyes, but um, there's a problem I'll talk about later. Other um, approach to extending the wavelength is to extend the conjugation, of course. So you, you see this other dye where the conjugation, it looks like a xanthine, but not quite. So they extend the conjugation in a different way. What's the problem here? So to make these dyes, you need multiple synthetic steps. So here I'm showing you an example from our group where we're trying to make the silicon fluorescein dye. And so I'm not gonna go through every step, but I wanna point out that between step one was horrible yield. And between step one and two, we had to protect and then deprotect um, step three to four and then reprotect. 
And so it was so many protection, deprotection, reprotection that this chemistry was not viable for materials. So we need to come up with a much um, shorter way to do this. And so we came up with a new design to extend the conjugation, to extend the, the wavelength by combining donor acceptor molecule. This works very well in the organic material, in the organic device um, field. And so we decided to look into that for our, our small molecule as well. And another thing we did, um, it wasn't intuitive, it's just something we just, we did, was we connected um, the, 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 the acceptor to the donor through the carbon atom instead of a nitrogen, as I'll show you here in a minute. So here's our acceptor, the xanthine core. And then we, have chose, we chose three different donors, a pyrrole, indole, and indolazine. And so the different dyes that we expect to produce are these over here. So as I mentioned that we have connected the, the xanthine core to the pyrrole through the carbon and not through the nitrogen, likewise the indole and the, in, the indolazine. So um, in terms of short synthesis, we were able to buy fluorescein and triflate it in one step. And then through Suzuki cross-coupling reaction, we can buy these, um, these compounds. We can do cross-coupling reaction and we can get in, in two steps, we can get to our product. So this was just the initial goal, just to see if we can, um, if our design approach worked. And so we were able to make these dyes and, um, and like I said, here's what it, it would look like if it was rhodamine, you would conjugate it through the nitrogen and not through the carbon. So we, move, we remove it one atom away. So we wanted to see what that gives us. So as you can see, we got pretty color compounds. So um, we have absorption um, in, in around the, uh, over the 650 that we're looking at and emission over 700, which is in the near IR1 region. If we, had con if we had conjugated through the nitrogen as in the rhodamine type dye, then you see our emission and absorption is way below what our, our, our target goal is. So the difference between that is about 150 nanometer for the absorbent absorption and about 180 nanometer redshift longer wavelength for the emission. So our design approach seemed to have worked. So we decided to try it with a, extending the conjugation by using um, indole instead of parole to see if we can further extend it. And we did. It wasn't much, much further, but it still extended the conjugation much further. So now we're all in 775 for the emission. Again, if we had extended it through the nitrogen, we are back down for the absorption under 650, and we're even low for the emission as well. So you can see that the design strategy worked. Again, the difference is only about 45 to, and 70 nanometers for absorption and emission respectively. So we decided to do the same thing for indolazine. So we needed to functionalize the indolazine, halogenation, borelation, anything, nothing worked. So that gave us a great opportunity to look at CH functionalization to see if we, that chemistry will work, and it did. And it worked um, reasonable well. So this is two stage functionalization in order, and we got this in 35% yield. Mind you, this is a pretty good yield for this kind of chemistry. And so we were able to open up the fluorophore so we can get it, the chromophore available. And when we do the absorption and emission, we have absorption over 900 nanometers. So now we're in the near IR2 region and our emission is even over a thousand nanometers. So this was pretty exciting for us. And so we're continuing to look into this chemistry. We're making water soluble versions of these and, um, and to explore in cellular imaging. So to conclude my second story, one of the ways to change the um, tune the band gap for xanthine based fluorophores um, is to change the, the atom to silicon and others. But another approach that we came up with is the accepted donor approach. And so that worked really well. And in addition to that, if we can, if we switch to, to conjugate the xanthine core, 
to the donor through the carbon instead of ni the nitrogen that led to significant increase in the absorption emission rate. So we're pretty happy about that. My final story that I want to tell you about today is how we are starting to look into post-functionalization of commodity products. So why we want to do that? So Frank Leifard um, published a pay, an Agavante paper that got our attention. Christine pointed this out to us about doing um, post-functionalization and commodity polymers to, um, to, to explore new and interesting properties that we wouldn't act, be able to access in any other way or actually not cheaper. And so that was one of our grand challenges in the center was how can we um, develop, use um, stage functionalization to, with commodity products. And so, um, to make a, so the, the chemistry for polymers is incredible. There are a lot of different ways we can make a lot of different sophisticated polymeric material. Um, we can generate all kinds of complex sh structure, shape. We can control molecular weight, um, a lot of different things. But these all require custom um, synthesis. And um, the current materials and with the design of polymers, um, even if they're superior, they're, it's still challenging to access. And it's going to be costly. And so CH functionalization could play a key role in here. We can take cheap, disposable waste commodity product polymers, and if we can functionalize the CH bonds, then we can leverage um, these high volume, low cost polymers into um, you know, high, high valued material. And the other thing is we don't have to come up with new industrial infrastructure to put to, to, to do this because it's already in existence. And so we can increase the value of commodity materials. We can discover new properties of, and upcycle of plastic waste. And so to, in order to do this though, it needs a paradigm shift. We need to see CH bonds as potential points to diversify rather than unreactive functional groups. And so with that being said, there are challenges. So commodity polymers are useful because they're stable. They don't, they don't um, you know, de decompose naturally and, um, and they don't react with a whole lot of stuff. So that's why we want to use them. Um, if you want to functionalize them, the current uh, method rely on harsh and non-selective reaction condition. We need to be able to have reactions that are robust enough to give you sufficiently high um, functionality so the properties can change. And of course, we talk about this schema selectivity. We cannot have side reactions or else because we cannot purify polymers that we can for small molecules. And so um, started looking into this a little bit and came across some work by um, Chulsong Bay um, group where they were able to take polystyrene and to post functionalize it through a CH borrelation reaction. And they were able to demonstrate that the reaction did not affect the tacticity of the polystyrene. However, with sufficient functionalization, the properties of the polystyrene started to change. And so um, he came up with um, further um, proof of this where you can take a polysulfone and you can fu post-functionalize it and you can see that you can get different um, groups. So the asterisks are the different changes in the NMR spectra where new, new peaks show up, which, which tells us reaction occurred. So we wanted to look into this a little bit. So we decided we wanted something that was liquid. And so we, we thought about polyphenol ether, and I'll tell you why we're looking for liquid in a minute. So Fred Allman in about 1906 was, um, developed this polyphenol ether. And what he didn't know back then was how extremely important it was going to become. Because it, it's the lubrication that they use now for extreme environment um, conditions. Because it has very great, it has very good properties. So it has high thermal and radiate, um, radiation resistant properties. It's chemically stable, high re refract indexes, and so forth. So the most important part of it is that it was thermally stable and stable to radiation. 
and it had really good surface area. So it actually is used in these, in these jets um, as the lubrication fluid because these jets get to really high altitude and some of the parts undergo really um, contrasting um, temperature changes. And so they need um, something that's very stable in order to do the lubrication. So I'm gonna pick up the pace a little bit. For those of you in the, in the center know my interest in silo containing um, compounds. And so we were looking into some of the work done by Stoltz and Grubb that they were able to do the um, potassium perpetoxide function, functionalizing diphenyl ether. And so in our, in our group, we were able to reproduce the synthesis in the first step, but went ahead in the second step to make a, a, a close the ring to, in, to give you a second CH, CH silation um, reaction. And so the question is, could we implement this? Could this be transferred to um, um, a, a compound like the polyphenol ether? Bear in mind, the yields are pretty low. So we were pretty skeptical about this chemistry, but we tried it nonetheless. So we used a small oligomer for the polymer and it's about five or six um, phenyl group in length. And so we ran the chemistry um, to do some silation, and I'm going to walk you through this NMR a little bit. So when we did the phenyl ether, we could see if we have a monosilation, we can see this silicon hydrogen peak in the NMR. When we did that for the, for the, the phenyl ether, we didn't see it at all. So I want to just blow up the aryl region for you, the aromatic region. So you can see that we do have some new peaks as well. So we are affecting the, the phenyl ether. So reaction is occurring. And, um, and so we were pretty excited about that. So I was like, what happened to the UV spectra? So, um, cause I'm, I'm more into some changing properties. And you can see that after the first treatment, we didn't see much change in the UV, but after the second treatment, you start to see a new peak evolving. So with um, inspiration from the Bay group, we decided to do the borelation of this reaction as well. And so here's again, the, the pump oil. And so we do the CH borelation reaction of it. And um, as you, and I'll show you in, a, in, a, in the next slide, um, the aromatic region some, but we can see immediately that we have some new changes. Following the borelation, we do Suzuki cross coupling reaction with bromothiophene. And we were able to see that the, the, the pinnacle group in the, for the boring um, disappeared after we do the Suzuki reaction. So if you do a blow up of this, you can see we got some new peaks in the borelation and even some newer peaks in the, the Suzuki reaction, some shifting in the NMR that I don't have time to go into the details of. But finally, if you take a look at the absorption spectra for the borelation, so this, the blue line is for the oil. And after the borelation reaction, you can see a slight red shift in the absorption spectra. But after you, you put the thiophene on there, you can see even a bigger red shift. So we're pretty excited about that as well. And if you look at the, the emission spectra, we got emission in the blue area. Now, this is pretty interesting because blue emissive um, compounds are, are, in, are in, in need. So we're, we have a lot of ideas about what we're doing with this. Um, we don't have time to talk about a lot of it, but um, just to show you a little bit about how we can post-functionalize um, commodity products. So with that, I wanna summarize the third part of my talk. So we were able to post-functionalize commodity products and say that it's a viable way to access new materials. Um, with the advances that we have in the CH functionalization, this allows for more robust chemistry like the CH borelation. And so other robust CH um, functionalization chemistry can be applied to these materials to discover new materials. So we expect to have some new materials on the horizon. So with that, I wanna end my talk by thanking the students who did this work. Um, so the students um, whose heads are circled in the green, um, Tataranga, Ishanka, and my postdoc, Dajan, are the ones that were involved in most of this chemistry, as well as one of my previous um, student, Dr. Nolan um, um, Bison, 
who is um, did the silo chemistry, along with Sam, who is currently at Emory, and Avery, who's currently at um, University of Georgia. They were undergrads in my group working on the silo chemistry. Um, I would like to thank my collaborators, Christine, Seth, Simon, and, and Brian for his, his conversation on the, the, the potassium terbitoxide chemistry, the CHSI um, chemistry, and also Jared Delcom and Nathan Hammer at University of Mississippi for their um, work on the emissive dye. Finally, the funding agency, this, um, the Center for Selective Stage Functionalization, and also the Center for Emergent Molecular Electronics for funding of this project. And with that, I wanna say thank you. And if there are questions, I um, can answer. Well, thank you very much, Colleen. Um, ju just a couple of very quick questions because we are a little bit over time. But um, so a question from uh, Nick, uh, from Stanford. Do you think uh, putting larger alkyl groups on the silicon would have the same degree of solubility enhancement as the backbone modifications? I'm not on the silo chemistry. So I, 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 I'm not sure which chemistry is talking about, but yeah, if, I think if we're talking about the, the silo chemistry, we do need some, um, some larger groups for solubility but I'm not sure if that's what he's asking. True with him. What, what is causing the, uh, the distillation in the polymerization step in the first project you presented? On the desilation? So I'm not sure, we haven't probed that specifically. We, we did do so um, we did look at the byproducts and we can see that the, um, the, the pivolic acid, whenever we use pivolic acid as our additive, we can see that we have silo pivolic acid. So the pivolic acid is the culprit, at least in, in that, under those conditions. And so um, we know that for sure, we don't know why. Okay. Okay, great. Well, thanks. Thanks very much, Colleen. Um, maybe you could join the chat room to continue.